Welcome to the journey home. Our theme for this program is magisterial authority. And I know from my background, those of you who come from similar backgrounds are not used to using that particular term, magisterial authority. But of course, it's a common Catholic term. And it talks about, it deals with how we determine what's true. In other words, if you have two people battling over the meaning of baptism, uh, do we baptize infants or only adult believers? Or uh, the meaning of a scripture text and how it applies in our life. Let's take uh, Ephesians 5. Uh, wives submit to your husbands. Well, do we still do that today or not? Okay, how do we decide whether that's true? Or whether we take the teachings of the Bible or tradition and apply them into the difficult areas of our life, like the pro-life questions. How do we determine what is the true application? And that brings us back to this important issue of authority. In our theme tonight, magisterial authority is one that was very important to our guest tonight, Father Rolf Tollefson. Uh, we met a couple years ago. In fact, I met him when he was still a seminarian. Mm -hmm. And he's been a, a priest for a little over a year. And he joins us tonight to tell us about his journey into the church. And God called him all the way into the priesthood. So it's exciting to have him with us tonight. Remember, you're an important part of this program every week. So if you give us a call with your question at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Father Rolf, thank you for joining us on the Journey Home. It's good to, to get you all the way down here. A long drive all the way from Minneapolis yes. to Paul. Thank you, Marcus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was praying that you were going to make it because a lot of things can happen between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Birmingham, sure. Alabama. But God got you here. So That's good. Glad you're here. There's a lot we want to cover tonight. So let me begin right off, okay. as I do every week, and invite the guests to give us a fill us in mm -hmm. with some of your spiritual background. Okay, sounds good. Well, I was uh, baptized in 1971 in the United Church of Christ, and I attended Union Congregational United Church of Christ in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. So it's a suburb of Minneapolis. And uh, I was really active there in many of the music programs there at the parish. So I was involved in the bell choir. I was involved in a singing choir. Uh, we even did Foray's Requiem one, one year, and it was just beautiful singing in Latin. At the UCC church? Yeah, a Catholic, part of a Catholic mass. It was Interesting. wonderful. Very and, uh, I don't know if they knew what they were getting into. but uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so next what happened is uh, I was involved with the youth group. And uh, we did a lot of work with justice and peace in the UCC, that's initials for the United Church of Christ. Um, uh, and we went on many mission trips. So we experienced the culture of poverty. We worked with those poor, who were poor and learned from them in uh, different cities in the United States. And we did a lot of work for Habitat for Humanity along the way as well. Um, and uh, But throughout this whole journey in the United Church of Christ, I was, I was kind of looking for... Um, historic Christianity or looking for the fullness of, of what it meant to be a Christian. So I kind of had a, a restless heart. I mean, I had a very personal devotion to Christ as my Lord and Savior. I had given my life to Him and, you know, whenever Billy Graham would be on TV, you know, and so forth. And I, and I really believed He's that. He's in your backyard up there in Minneapolis. That's Paul, right. right. They're <laughs> Harmon Place in Minneapolis. Uh -huh. That's right. And uh, that was all very important for me. But I was still uh, looking further for um, kind of a higher definition of what, what was true and what the historic uh, Christian church believed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that parallels that, that part of my own journey because mm. after my Lutheranism brought up, I became eventually ordained a Congregationalist. And I made the journey to Presbyterianism for the exact same search mm -hmm. because the struggle of Congregationalism, mm -hmm. particularly, is, touches this issue which you've chosen as a theme tonight, mm -hmm. this issue of authority, mm -hmm. magisterial authority. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, let me ask you, have you go back a little bit in your sure. thinking, as a member of the UCC Church, mm -hmm. what was the authority on any of these issues? Right. There wasn't so much of an authority they would have in the UCC, what was called the Freedom of Conscience Clause, where you could, uh, you know, in accord with tradition, but still on a local level, according to your parish, and especially according to the conscience of the individual believer, you would kind of uh, make your own determination as to what was true uh, and what was in accord with Christianity in, in terms of its history. 
Yeah, so mm -hmm. the conscious becomes becomes the highest authority mm -hmm. for the individual's life. You even mentioned the word tradition as you were describing it. Yeah. Because, I mean, what would be tradition for a UCC mm -hmm. person? Right. It'd be basically um, since 1957 would be when the denomination was formed. Although, of course, as you know, uh, the congregational part of the United Church of Christ came into being much earlier right. um, with the, the English Reformation and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, my part of the United Church of Christ was the Evangelical and Reformed Church, which historically had uh, German roots uh, that were mixed Lutheran and Reformed background. So it's interesting to look at that mm -hmm. mixture of roots. You have English Congregationalism, you have mm -hmm. German, the German uh, mm -hmm. Reformed, which was a bit of a Lutheran, Calvin, mm -hmm. the whole mixture of all that. Mm -hmm. And again, you have in those three different traditions, Congregationalist, Lutheran, mm -hmm. uh, Calvinist, mm -hmm. completely different understandings exactly. of any particular theological issue. Mm -hmm. The meaning of mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper, how often you should do it, Mm -hmm. So what, for a UCC person, when it came down to any of those issues, how would it be determined? How would they determine, like, the Lord's Supper, its meaning or its practice? Right. They would look traditionally toward more of the, the background that's been found in the confessions. For example, uh, in the Reformed tradition, the Westminster Confession, I'm not so clear on the congregational background on that. But they would ultimately, in that uh, tradition, turn to uh, Calvin. And uh, they would see the Lord's Supper, for example, in terms of a spiritual presence. And so, for example, when I started my uh, college education, which was back in 1989 at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, um, I always struggled with the fact that Lutherans said that uh, Christ was really present in, with, and under those elements. I didn't quite understand what that meant. Then I read a book, and uh, the book was written by a Lutheran pastor. And as you know, Lutherans do have some more of a sense of sacramental yeah. theology. And he describes sacraments as extensions of the incarnation in our world today. Mm -hmm. Extensions of the incarnation. And that helped me to understand uh, more of a sacramental outlook on life and helped prepare the way for the Catholic Church's understanding of sacraments. Was, was that kind of where your heart got started for the Catholic Church? Was that book itself? And I would say that, that really helped me too. Also, uh, a book by Cardinal Ratzinger, Principles of Catholic Theology, um, that was very foundational for me because Cardinal Ratzinger grew up in a, in a kind of a mixed area in Bavaria that was, as I believe, uh, partially Lutheran and, and partially Catholic and probably some reform mixed in there too. So he knew how to uh, uh, integrate well some of the genius and some of the true things that were in Protestantism, but then also to correct it yeah. and to show the, ca the fullness of the Catholic teaching. Well, so you're in college. Mm -hmm. Um, searching for something more historical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that what got you started? I mean, uh, these books kind of fell on your lap at that time? Or? That was part of it. I also was searching for uh, a church that, that truly had an overall pro-life message. Mm -hmm. I had always been in favor of uh, uh, a totally abolishing abortion and also, uh, incidentally, always opposed to contraception as well. It seemed to me something not very natural and in God's plan. Let me just jump in here because I don't, I certainly don't want to pick at uh, the denomination you were part of, but right. in that particular congregation's denomination, it was difficult for that as a church mm -hmm. to make a decision on any of those issues. Wasn't that true? Right. There was no complete consensus. I mean, of course, there were some pastors who believed the story of right. Christian teaching on pro-life issues, but because of the freedom of conscience clause where you could kind of believe, you know, there was, there was I would say too much diversity or too much openness yeah. in, that, in that context. Yeah. Okay, so this was the issue that kind of got you moving. That was church. certainly part of it, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's continue and sure. fill us in there. You bet. I was uh, uh, at St. Olaf College, and, and during the summers, I went to this Lutheran church camp as a counselor. So I was a naturalist, and I helped to identify plants and so forth. And, and I was still searching during the summers. It gives you more time to pray and reflect. And by that time, I was praying the divine office. And, uh, How'd that happen? Yeah. <laughs> well, I had been uh, associated with the Catholic parish in town, St. Dominic's, and the priest there, Father Ron Club, gave me the Liturgy of the Hours, the short version, you know, the really shorter Christian prayer. Yeah. And uh, I began to pray, and, and inside of this breviary was a holy card, and on the holy card was this prayer, the Memorare. <laughs> the Memorare. And, and I was really afraid to kind of pray this prayer to Mary at the time because, you know, I had, had seen historically Mary as being more of a detraction to the Catholic mm -hmm. faith instead of 
our mother and, and the, the, the one we can turn to for help to bring us to Christ. Not that she would be an end in herself, but would bring us to Christ. And I, I prayed that prayer very reluctantly, but I did anyway. I said, Christ, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just going to pray this prayer. So remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, and I prayed the prayer. And a couple of weeks later, what came in the mail is a letter from Marytown, which is uh, the conventional Franciscan friars in <laughs> Libertyville, Illinois. I believe that you had uh, shown on EWTN a benediction from Marytown mm-hmm. uh, in the past for a couple of years. And at Marytown, that was the place where I began to appreciate even more and more the authority of the church. Mm-hmm. The authority of the church when it taught about Mary, uh, it's showing us that she is the Immaculate Conception, showing us that, that because of God's overpowering grace and, and sovereign choice, He chose Mary to be free from original sin. Mm-hmm. And understanding the Assumption as well, mm-hmm. in which uh, she was given a grace by God to participate in the resurrection uh, as the first to participate in the bodily mm-hmm. resurrection of Christ. So I went to Marytown to figure out these things and continue on my journey home. I was going to say that those are uh, quite a bit different than your UCC upbringing. Because in all those areas you've mentioned, well, let me ask you this, because it was a freedom of conscience clause that a UCC person might have, mm-hmm. yet would you have looked back and seen any UCC folk that felt in any way like you just described your relationship to Mary? Uh, could you clarify that question? I mean, you know, the, the beliefs you just described about Mary, mm-hmm. you look back on your UCC friends or any of the past, yeah. did any of them believe that at all about them? I know they had freedom to do that. That's true, that's right. Um, I don't believe we ever had any conversations about yeah. who Mary was. No. It just never really came up. No. I think that's true of my own background. Oh, Even okay. my Lutheran background it just didn't come up as much. So I'm, I'm pleased to see so many Lutherans today having, being more open to what yeah. Luther was, de- was himself devoted to. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This commentary on the visitation, I believe, is very beautiful in, in praise of Mary. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so there you were uh, being drawn, I mean, there you are uh, reading the daily office mm-hmm. and going to Marytown. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What about your, your background, your family, all of that in relationship to your kind of, at least the direction you were going in? Were they... How is my family? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're probably watching right now. So. <laughs> they, they're, um, they're very supportive, and uh, they've gone through a lot of change in, in seeing the things that I've done in my life. And, and uh, along the way, there have been a couple of bumps in the road, but, but God has been very generous. And I have uh, to thank for that. I have all my seminarian friends especially who have had a chance to meet my, uh, my parents and family and to talk with them so they can see that becoming Catholic and becoming a priest wasn't such a crazy idea. Well, we're going to have time later in the program maybe to go on some of the other hurdles that you had to jump through at this point. But well, how long was it in your journey from the time you're mm-hmm. reading some of these books and going to Marytown that you actually made the jump into the church? Well, I uh, went to Marytown in the fall of 93, and then I went back home to uh, Minneapolis uh, and eventually found a parish. And uh, there at the parish was a Lutheran convert you had in your show a couple of years ago, I believe, yeah. Larry Blake. And yeah. Larry was you know, recently ordained to the priesthood of Father Larry Blake. But it's so amazing how God is so, had blessed my life in so many ways that I had had these wonderful people along the way at Marytown, um, support of friends, and then to meet uh, Larry Blake to kind of put the icing on the cake and then come into the Catholic Church in April of 1994 at the okay. Great Vigil of Easter. So I'm sure his own struggles that he went through in his journey were yet uh, clearing the path for you for a lot of the doctrinal issues that were so different. than Absolutely, yeah. because you can read a lot about the Catholic faith, but to see it uh, incarnate or personalized in a person makes that faith so much more believable or real at times, I yeah. believe. And it was a good, a, a great joy to have Father Larry. And to see him yeah. again just a couple months yeah. ago when I was up there speaking. Oh, right very good. Well, got a chance to see Father Larry. Uh, but what about the priesthood? When did that cross mm-hmm. your mind? The priesthood has always, has always kind of been in the background, lingering around. And, you know, I had gone to St. Olaf to be pre-med and uh, switched majors to history to consider becoming a pastor. But um, the priesthood had always kind of been around there because I had especially been attracted to the liturgy and uh, experiencing the real presence of Christ as I understood that sacramentally uh, in the Eucharist. And to be an agent of Jesus Christ, to give his body and blood to the people, 
uh, w is the greatest privilege that uh, I've been called to in my life, and mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that gift from Archbishop Flynn, my ordinary. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about this. Explain, first of all, what we mean by the word magisterium, because you and I know in our background it wasn't a common term. Certainly. Magisterium comes from the Latin magister, teacher, so it's the, the teaching of the church. And the good news about the magisterium is that uh, Christ loved his church so much that he gave this magisterial authority to his apostles. And these apostles, uh, they handed on this magisterial authority. That's what traditio means, or tradere, to hand on. Uh, this authority uh, and this uh, teaching authority down from the generations up into the very present. And so that's why, of course, we call the bishops the successors of the apostles, mm -hmm. our link to Jesus Christ and the ancient church because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So the magisterium are mm -hmm. the ordained teachers mm -hmm. of the church, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the bishops mm -hmm. that have followed in apostolic succession. But we recognize that one bishop sometimes teaches a little different than another bishop. And sometimes throughout history, mm -hmm. uh, that can be a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. So how does one define magisterial authority? Well, the good news is in the Catholic Church, of course, we have the Pope, which means that uh, the Pope eventually is the one who needs to make the difficult decisions because, of course, in his person, he has been given the gift of infallibility of the Church not his personal infallibility, but the, of the church to him in his person, uh, to make those tough decisions in consultation with the body of bishops. So the beauty of Catholicism is that we have the conciliarity or the working together of the bishops, but then if there is a disagreement, uh, the Pope is the one who can intervene and make the final decision. And he can't make that willy-nilly or... No. All the Pope can That's do. That's not misunderstood. Exactly. Yeah. All the Pope can do, of course, is hand on the deposit of faith, the revelation that God has given to us, and simply unpack it or um, show its organic development over time. Talk about that development. You mentioned it earlier. Sure. Because that's very important to sure, understand this authority. One of the best classes I had in seminary was, uh, was uh, Cardinal Newman's seminar by Dr. Don Briel. And in that class at St. Thomas, which is the university associated with St. Paul Seminary in St. Paul, he talked about the development of doctrine. And the development of doctrine means that, that uh, the church is like an acorn. It, it looks, or the church is like a, a tree, actually. It looks like an acorn in its developmental stages early. But then as it develops, it turns into the beautiful flowering tree. And so the church gives us the tradition, which is kind of like the acorn, and then over time unpacks its meaning and shows uh, through its magisterial authority what are developments and what are corruptions. And Cardinal Newman, that great theologian in the church, gave us a list of excellent criteria to help us determine, in accord with scripture, tradition, and reason, and the magisterium, of course, what an authentic development of doctrine is. Uh, an example of uh, that that uh, Father Pacwa and I um, uh, looked at earlier today as we were looking at uh, the gospel text for um, when Jesus in Luke 10 sends the apostles out and tells them to go proclaim the gospel but not to take any mm -hmm. money with you, don't take anything at all with you, don't take any food, uh, uh, you know, you're going to be provided for along the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's an example of, um, is that a normative statement? for every single person mm -hmm. who goes out, should all of us? Mm -hmm. Or was he speaking to the apostles themselves mm -hmm. at that time right. in history? And so the discernment of what's true and how it's to be applied. Um, plus, if you took that, that was what he said in the first century. Well, now mm -hmm. how do we, how has that been applied exactly. for you know, 20 centuries, 21 centuries, mm -hmm. as we go through all different mm -hmm. cultural changes? The, uh, exactly. That's the gift to the magisterium, that, that Christ knew that, that um, there would be new problems that would surface in our midst, like in biomedical morality, that those writers in the early church wouldn't have any idea about. The seeds th are there for an answer, yes, but the good news is that the living voice of the Holy Spirit in the world is this magisterium of bishops in communion with the Pope to give us answers to contemporary problems that are faced in our midst the gift of magisterial authority. You know, it's sad when I hear people will decry the idea, I'm not going to answer some pope, you know, that has this mm -hmm. quote 
infallibility to declare some issue, but then when you step back and you ask them, okay, well, who is your magisterial authority? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because, as Newman himself said, everyone must have a pope. Mm -hmm. That's right. And often it's ourselves. Well, I'm going to decide what's true for me. But well, wait a second. Mm -hmm. How do you know that you're speaking truth or you're speaking because you're, the sandwich you ate yesterday is giving you a bad feeling in your gut and so that's why you don't like something? I mean, mm -hmm. that, there's the key issue. And this development issue is very interesting. Uh, in fact, let's talk a little bit about and maybe take some specific examples sure. of how to understand this magisterial authority in the ways of our life. Let's take, for example, liturgy. How does that touch on the importance of liturgy? Well, I think one of the important things to remember is that uh, we had the, the Second Vatican Council, which gave us uh, many beautiful things in, in the document uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium on the liturgy. And uh, the beauty of the, of the authority of the Church is that now we've been given a standard to be implemented throughout the Universal Church, for example. That would be, for example, um, the importance of Gregorian chant that uh, the church never said that you know Gregorian chant or Latin should be suppressed but rather these things should be cultivated with a new vigor in the midst of the faithful and the authority of the church helps to carry out that mandate of the council you know the, what's the difference between the magisterial authority and the spirit of Vatican II mm -hmm, exactly <laughs> exactly I think that's that spirit of the Vatican II I mean some people can use as kind of a means to you know maybe get around what the council was actually saying instead of actually just carrying out the, the true developments that, of doctrine that happened at the Council yeah. in accord fully with tradition. See, that, that, sadly, that phrase, the spirit of Vatican II, we're doing this in the spirit of Vatican II, mm -hmm. that's like, what are you lifting up as authority there? I mean, technically, what is one lifting it up? One's lifting up, well, this is kind of the way I want to do it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or kind of the way I think we ought to do it, or yeah. it's the way a bunch of us are doing it, yeah. and so we give permission but it doesn't have real authority. It's groundless. Exactly. So one of the ways to promulgate that authority in the Catholic Church is to use liturgical books, for example, with rubrics in them that have been tried and tested over time and, and help us to celebrate the liturgy in a unified way. Very important uh, means of implementing liturgical uh, decrees of the authority of the Church. Okay. And uh, Let's take another area, why not? Well, you mentioned Mary earlier. Talk mm -hmm. a bit about how Magister Authority helped you in your own you know, mm -hmm. acceptance of the Marian mm -hmm. dogmas. Well, I think one of the things that's important to understand is that the magisterial authority of the Church should also be seen as the loving authority of the Mother that is the Church. And so really when the Church teaches, it's not meant to uh, uh, just slap someone over the wrist or something like that. It's rather to show with a motherly concern uh, the symphony of faith, as Hans Urth von Balthasar said, that, that there's something beautiful about the symphony when it's played. So the church teaches something because it's true. You know, that, that's the reason why it teaches us. And we know that our minds have been made to live in accord with the truth, because by living the truth, we'll be supremely happy. And so the magisterium can help us to recognize what, when something is true, uh, in, a, in addition with reason. Both are very important. What's exciting about that is that when it comes to areas like science mm -hmm. or the relationship between science and the faith, what, what's beautiful about the church's commitment to truth is that it's unafraid of what is true. Exactly. Uh, and that's why the magisterium uh, can venture off into areas that maybe other faiths fear to tread because we believe that we're seeking truth. And so, let's take the issues of maybe the biomedical mm -hmm. issues. You know, how does the magisterial help us in those areas? Mm -hmm. I would say that, that um, as you mentioned, truth is truth is truth. So, if something has been determined by science to be a fact, then the church looks upon it as a fact as well. If it's a theory, it's a theory. Um, but the magisterium is the one that can help us, specifically in terms of faith and morals, mm -hmm. to understand when we're in those very difficult situations, what decision to make that is in accord with tradition and reason and is compassionate in a true sense yeah. to it toward the patient who is suffering, for example. And sometimes in her, his, in her wisdom, the church uh, doesn't so much reject something with the truth, uh, but it's also trying to be pastoral. 
with the application of that truth into a culture that may not be ready. Exactly. Speaking the truth in love yeah. is the way to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, what about the Eucharist? Now, you talk about mm -hmm. the differences in that. There's an example of how the different authorities of your own spiritual journey exactly. help define different understandings of the Eucharist. Exactly. And I mean, the, the unanimous tradition of the Orthodox churches and of the Latin and Byzantine and any other kind of Eastern Rite Catholic churches I'll teach that, that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist and have done that since we can look at our earliest documents that show that, that, uh, that this teaching is, is true. And uh, that is the teaching that Jesus Christ is present here among us on earth, just as he was among us uh, on earth uh, 2,000 years ago. Okay. One, you and I both share both a Lutheran background mm -hmm. and a congregationalist background, though they were kind of flip flop. Mm -hmm. You started congregationalist, went Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I started Lutheran, went congregationalist, then Presbyterian, whatever else. I mm -hmm. jumped in it for a while before I ended up uh, home in the Catholic Church. But uh, uh, one verse that was uh, uh, very important to us congregationalists was Matthew 18:20. And I thought you might reflect again on the majesty of authority in relationship to this verse. It, it says this, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do know from my background the way that verse was often used was to justify the start of a new church whenever one was necessary. Yeah. So what about ministerial authority in relationship to that church? Sure. Well, uh, the church understands this passage in a Catholic way. And Catholic, I'm here using, I suppose, both in a big C and a little c. Little c, I mean in terms of universal, big C in terms of Catholic. But universal means that th that, that congregation of two and three needs to be in full communion with other parishes of two or three or 200 or whatever. And then those parishes in each country need to be in communion with all the parishes of the entire world. And so the magisterial authority of the church, the Pope, makes visible in his, in his person, that's the sacramental principle at work here, makes visible the unity of the church in his person. So that in, throughout the church there are diversity of ways of worshiping according to the Roman rite, but that all of them find their unity in what the church teaches in Rome. Uh, uh, another verse that this kind of goes right along with your saying was a, a, the epistle, epistle reading for the Marianite rite mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. was uh, from 1 Corinthians 3 where Paul is talking to the Corinthians who have a, they have a struggle there. He's trying to straighten them out mm -hmm. in Corinth. Mm -hmm. And he says, brothers, I could not talk to you as spiritual people but as fleshly people, as infants in Christ. I could only give you milk. And he goes on and says, what was the problem? Well, the problem was there was jealousy and rivalry among you mm -hmm. um, you know, some, wherever someone says, I belong to Paul, and others says, I belong to Paul. And so right away we had this division, exactly. the temptation towards this division very early on, because we have two groups that feel a little differently about mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Paul, so again, this call mm -hmm. for unity, mm -hmm. uh, and to recognize, again, the apostolic authority mm -hmm. from which they were taught. Mm -hmm. okay. well, we're going to take a break. Okay. Come back just a minute with your questions for Father Rolf. Father Rolf Tollefson. Remember the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. I'll be with you in just a moment. My guest this evening is Father Rolf Tollefson. He's uh, a convert from uh, the United Church of Christ, Congregationalist, uh, with a Lutheran phase, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, drawn to the Catholic Church, and then here's a priest, and he shared our journey with us. Our theme for tonight was magisterial authority. Mm -hmm. We're talking, really getting down to the core of in any issue we're talking about, how does one determine whether it's true or not? Mm -hmm. And we're recognizing that Christ in his wisdom and his gift of grace gave us the apostles that he chose and, and then gave them the grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth as he promised in John chapter 14, 
15 and 16. He even said he'd help them remember what he had taught them. So we see that gift of the teaching, uh, which, would, which they re would receive after the resurrection uh, in fulfillment of his call to go you therefore and baptize and make disciples, baptizing and teaching them. Is that in Matthew 28? Mm -hmm. And uh, so there we see this magisterial authority coming. And immediately in the, in the New Testament epistles, we encounter places where Paul, with his apostolic authority, Peter, James, mm -hmm. using their authority to, to talk to, to write to churches and help bring them back on track when they're being drawn away by other voices mm -hmm. that don't have the authority of truth, mm -hmm. but pretend they do. They mm -hmm. sound good. And doesn't that sound like today? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the danger today? I mean, we have so right. many people mm -hmm. that are lifting up all kinds of things of authority. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. that uh, makes it hard for people. Mm -hmm. Let's take our first caller. <clears throat> Hello, it's Rick from Colorado. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, Marcus, first of all, I, I love your show. It, thank you. It was instrumental in my conversion to the church. Oh, well, great, Rick. Welcome Thanks, home. Dad. Well, thank you. Uh, Father, my question is this. Uh, first of all, what kind of a reaction did you get from your family when you converted to the church? And then... Uh, more so, what happened when you told them you were going to be a priest? <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, uh, Rick, basically what happened is, is that they were, you know, kind of concerned about that. Um, but uh, then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the program, uh, as they met my friends from the seminary, I can really point to them. And as my parents came to those uh, liturgies along the way, uh, they became more and more understanding of the Catholic thing. And as for the priesthood thing, I, I think that basically uh, my parents uh, understood that, that in a certain sense it, it made me happy to be a priest and so they were very understanding and tolerant about that. And the rest of my family I think uh, kind of saw it as a, as a fit, that this is what I wanted to do with my life, to, to give my life uh, uh, to Christ in terms of being his priest and uh, in that way. So. You know, you've mentioned um, introducing your family to the Catholics. Mm -hmm. you know, it reminds me that it's one thing to read all the books and the early fathers and all of that to draw us into the Catholic Church, but it really comes down to it. One of the most important aspects of what draws us into the Church are Catholics that live their faith. Exactly. I mean, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree with that? Yep. Uh, again, uh, living witnesses to the truth. I mean, take a look at Mother Teresa. Or when I was down at Marytown, I had the, the privilege of editing a book on St. Maximilian Colby. I mean, mm -hmm. that wonderful uh, priest who gave his life for a family man in, the, in Auschwitz. All of those are, are different means or different uh, uh, yeah, means that, that God has used to show his grace and his power in the world today. All right. And of course, it reminds us that each one of us in our... I mean, that's, that's Mother Teresa and Father Colby, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that, uh, that we ourselves aren't to be that, uh, mm -hmm. be that witness because um, <clears throat> so many of us, so many people in the world are looking for someone who is living their faith, mm -hmm. whose faith is authentic, it's real. Um, and sadly, we are surrounded by a lot of people that will say one thing but walk another. And so that's so important. Uh, to live our faith. Let's, let's go with our first email here. This comes from Susan on Ohio. Uh, tells that wonder how far away she is from, from my home oh, in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gordai and Father Tollefson, I am a recent convert to Catholicism, <coughs> coming from a rather, quote, New Agey background. My father is very anti Catholic and anti organized religion, while my mom just loves the Lord. Here's my dilemma. I haven't told them I converted. Ah, so you just did because they're watching this. <laughs> okay, uh, I fear that telling them would cause my father to shut me out completely and that it would keep me from making any headway at all when I speak to him about God. I know that he knows that I am a Christian and he seems much more open to Christianity than he once was. Am I being deceptive by holding back the fact that I'm Catholic? And I'm ashamed of my, uh, excuse me, I'm not ashamed yeah. of my Catholicism. Thank you, and God bless. And thank you for your question, Susan. Yeah. Susan, that's a really good uh, uh, question. It's a, it's a dilemma. It's difficult. I think that there's some fear there, perhaps, and I had a lot of fear myself in, you know, sitting down with my parents and, and letting them know that I was for sure going to become Catholic and everything. But uh, I th believe it's First John who tells us the perfect love drives out all fear. And, uh, you know, do, do some discernment, Susan, with your local parish priest. 
to, to find out what would be the best prudent way to, to tell, but I believe that probably telling your dad in time, at the right time, would be a, a revelation of truth. And the truth will set us free. Yeah. That's what Jesus told us. The truth will set us free. And this may sound flippant to some people, but prayer mm -hmm. is the most important thing that she can do right now, Absolutely. along with all that. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you ever heard the word novena? In your journey? Novena. Must have been at Marytown. <laughs> when I was down there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I... I had never heard that word before, and I remember on my journey, and I was faced with some dilemma like that, and some Catholic says, well, just pray a novena, and I'm mm -hmm. like, it's a novena, mm -hmm. I'd never mm -hmm. heard that term, mm -hmm. and what that is, it's a wonderful thing, and that is making a commitment of praying nine days yeah. as a sacrifice, as an offering, mm -hmm. and it's not a manipulation, it's not forcing God's hand, exactly. but it's really more of a, a personal surrender exactly. when you... Uh, when you have something that you're having a hard decision to make or something you love, so you're offering it up to the Lord and you're praying these nine days, trusting. And that nine days goes back to the early church, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Praying for the descent of the Holy Spirit to come. And I think that's exactly what, Susan, we need in your situation as well as whatever problems anyone out there is going through, is to ask the Holy Spirit to come, that spirit of consolation, you know, from, you know, from Greek, you know, Parakletos or, or paraclete means the one called to one side. So I think Mark, it's a great idea to do a novena, e perhaps even to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Asking for the Lord's will to be done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, putting it into God's hand, praying nine days and just trusting. Again, it's also in First John that you pray, expecting and believing, mm -hmm. and you're releasing it into God's hand and accepting whatever He would bring. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of, there may be those those. Uh, misunderstandings with those in our family that do not understand why we would become Catholic, especially mm -hmm. if they come from a position of real strong anti-Catholic. But the most important thing in the midst of that is you'll love them through the midst of it. you okay. love them all the way through. Mm -hmm. God knows them better than they know themselves. So we trust God on that. Let's take our next caller, Rebecca, from uh, Louisiana. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Good evening, Marcus. I'm a former Protestant gently brought home to the church by my loving husband. Oh, God oh. bless him. Praise God. I am a faithful viewer of your program, and I have a question for Father Ross tonight. Uh, okay. What is the difference between dogma and doctrine? Oh. And what is the responsibility of Catholics for accepting the dogmas and doctrines of the church? That's Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca, that's a great question, and I wonder if my dogmatic professor, Father Differner, at the seminary is watching right now. <laughs> uh, we don't, no more tests, though. So that's don't right. worry about it. Yeah, they're beyond it. Too. Yeah. A dogma is an infallible truth of the faith that must be meant that must be met with uh, uh, an assent of the intellect and will. So a dogma is an infallible big truth of the faith, and a doctrine, I believe, is those other truths in the faith that support that teaching but formally speaking, are not strictly infallible, but they may be. Further development of doctrine can help us understand if those doctrines can turn into dogmas. That would be my stab at that. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. Um, and uh, it's interesting that the, you talked earlier about the infallibility of the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the history of, of, of having this gift of grace, there's only twice in the whole history of the church when he has declared a dogma, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, the Assumption mm -hmm. and the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Again, many people say, oh, they invented this, you know, in 1860. He threw mm -hmm. this together, whatever the date was. I forget the date, but no, as you said, he is completing this. Exactly. That the seeds in the church have been sown through having a feast in honor of the Blessed Virgin's, uh, Virgin Mary's Assumption, I believe in, I don't know when, in early church sometime, the fourth century perhaps. Uh, and then that developed over time into an infallible teaching. In fact, I think Luther had a devotion to the uh, Immaculate Conception, I think, it, in that aspect yeah, of so. Mary. So, I mean, that goes way back. It's not a new thing by any means, but exactly. right, yeah. you know, declaring something that this is a teaching of the Church, mm -hmm. and therefore we trust the Church mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in its wisdom. Okay, let's take our next uh, email from Karen and Paul Cronin, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They're transplants from Birmingham, they say here. Uh, hello, Father Tolson and Marcus. My husband and I watch every Monday night, and I just said to him this evening, <laughs> well, uh, good to talk to you, uh, Karen, that I hope that we would see a Church of Christ conversion some night. 
you must have been praying in novena for the last nine days before tonight's <laughs> program. Uh, could you please tell us if the UCC is related to the Church of Christ? Thank you. We welcome you home. Thanks for your email, Karen. Yeah. That's good. She asked that because yeah, that's a good names of, of denominations out there can get real confusing. Right. I believe that those are two very different denominations, Marcus. You could probably fill me in on the Church of Christ a little bit more, but I believe the Church of Christ is more of an a evangelical uh, tr a church or ecclesiastical yeah. communion, actually. Yeah. And the United Church of Christ is very much more of an you know, open Protestant denomination. Let's see. United, you define the United Church of Christ as really a, uh, a union of two once completely distinct, distinct mm -hmm. traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the Church of Christ, now I wish I had Bruce Sullivan on my show tonight because mm -hmm. he's a, a convert from uh, Church of Christ, who's oh. now Catholic, he's been on a couple times, and he's uh, my local expert uh, on the Church of Christ. But it is a separate movement um, uh, that came from a pastor whose last name is Campbell, I think in the 1800s. Now, I might be wrong on that, but it's a completely separate movement. Yeah. It, right. Again, it's uh, the, the names of denominations out there it can be Church of God. There's lots of Church of Gods, Church of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so it can become confusing. Mm -hmm. Let's Absolutely. take our next caller, Gene from Illinois. What's your question? Um, uh, first, I'd like to say how much I enjoy your program. Mm -hmm. and, uh, listen, I look forward to it every week. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, uh, I've heard you in the past, and I heard Father Tolson tonight uh, referring to the Eucharist. He said, uh, and the real presence, to prove the real presence we can refer to our earliest documents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know what he means by that, our earliest documents. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Great okay. question. Good question. Um, I would say that, first of all, of course, you know, we want to turn to the Word of God for the belief in the real presence of the Eucharist. So that means that we want to look to John 6. We want to look toward the institution of the Eucharist narratives. We want to look at Paul and uh, his documentation of the dominical words, or the words of Christ. Uh, what I was thinking in particular of is that in the Catholic Church, we have this great thing called tradition, with a capital T. So we have great documents of the past that help support this tradition. For example, the uh, Didache is what I was thinking of, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Yeah. And uh, the, the Canon of Hippolytus, which is, uh, in a modified form, is Eucharistic Prayer II, which the priest uses on the Sunday Mass. Yeah. And all of these uh, documents together, those would be some examples of documents, uh, point to this belief in the real presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very important question because I know that as a Protestant, uh, I, whenever I wanted to, to uh, determine whether something was true, I would go to Scripture. But if we struggled in the modern times with how to understand something, our goal was always to go back to the early church mm -hmm. to try to understand from the earliest sources what was true. Mm -hmm. And of course, we just always jumped over everything and went right to the Bible. Mm -hmm. But if I suppose, uh, and you can make a comment about this, Father, that if you understand visually the periods of time in the early church, let's take the, the first hundred years, mm -hmm. you get the second hundred years, the third hundred years, so you have the, the third century, mm -hmm. and then the fourth century, mm -hmm. all right? Four hundred years. Well, in that first century, of course, around year 30, we have the death and resurrection of Christ in the earliest church, mm -hmm. but all those New Testament documents are written over these next 70 years mm -hmm. of that first century. Mm -hmm. During those 70 years, we have lots of other documents that are being written about the same time. The Didache is mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. the, the, the book of uh, Clement, mm -hmm. the letters of Clement towards the end of that. Mm -hmm. um, all these are being written about this time. So one of the earliest struggles was, you've got the Old Testament documents. Mm -hmm. Which of all these documents being written in this first century are we to consider authentic? to determine what's true. Some of them were good, some of them were spurious. Mm -hmm. In that second hundred years, dozens and dozens of other documents are arising. Mm -hmm. So the point is that we have this first hundred years, the second hundred years, the third hundred years, mm -hmm. the fourth hundred years. It wasn't until then, mm -hmm. towards the end of that 400 years, that the Bible as we know it is finally determined by the church which of these books we are to include, which of them we are not. Mm -hmm. So we have 400 years, almost, mm -hmm. of when Christians are trying to determine what's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you trust? Mm -hmm. You trust the authority of the church, mm -hmm. who faithfully passes down this tradition mm -hmm. and lifts up those of the earliest writings mm -hmm. that can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And we can find those today. They're called the apostolic writers mm -hmm. of Clement and Ignatius. Mm -hmm. 
and the Didache. Mm -hmm. We also have the early church fathers of Irenaeus. And so we have all these wonderful books that we encourage you to read. In fact, I'd like to recommend a book that is an excellent book. Uh, it's called The Four Witnesses by Rod Bennett. And I hope to get Rod on my show sometime this year. He's a convert. It's an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation of four of the earliest writers of the church, selections from their writings, but not just giving them cold, but they're surrounded by their histories. Mm. And now it flows into the story of the early church. Excellent. It's Ignatius Press book, very recent published book. I strongly recommend it, Four Witnesses. Mm. All right. Let's take our next caller. Uh, Martin from uh, Nebraska, what's your question for us tonight? Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask Father, uh, how did it feel when going to confession or Eucharist? How was his feeling going for the first time and taking holy vows? Uh, oh, uh, how did he feel, excited or scared? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Martin. That's a great, great question. Uh, I love confession, and I just want to tell everyone out in the country tonight, confession is great. <laughs> uh, when I, I had uh, you know 22 years of sins and and I just <laughs> I needed to get all that off my chest and you know Marcus as you know you don't always you don't need to feel the sacraments but sometimes God can give you that grace as kind of a means to get you into the faith and so God did that for me in my first confession I could float away I was so unburdened from sins. So I would just encourage everyone out there to go to confession if you can. And um, please try to experience Christ Jesus, for he is the one who will absolve you from your sins in the confessional. Now you're on the other side. Yeah. I mean, there you were uh, in, the, in the empty box at first, and then now you're on the other side. Talk a little bit about that side of it. I mean, the, the responsibility, but a lot right. of people are a little, a little awkward about uh, they are. opening up. And I try to be very um, relaxed with people and just let them feel that, that they're in the presence of God and so sometimes I welcome them people at St. Charles my parish know this peace be with you or uh, something to get them relaxed into, into a frame of mind but then for them to, to know that they can feel free under the seal of confession to, uh, so that I will never tell what's in the confession uh, to anyone uh, their deepest darkest secrets and uh, it's, it's very much the case that the Holy Spirit has done all of the work, almost all of the work. I mean, of course, we've cooperated to get to confession, which is important. But the Holy Spirit has given them a spirit of contrition, a spirit of coming to that. And then, as the words flow, sometimes the tears flow as well. As we get down to the deep reasons, you know, one of the first principles of the, of the confessor is, why, am, why is this penitent here? If you can answer that question, then you can help address the, the needs of that person. And, but of course, the most important thing is just giving them the absolution of the church to be free from their sins. One of the reasons that I think confession is one of the most powerful sacraments, and I, I have to admit I probably don't go off as, as often as I should. It's still a struggle, mm -hmm. uh, sure. especially when you travel as much as I do. But because one of the most important barriers to our spiritual growth is the difference between a hard heart and a contrite heart. Mm -hmm. That really stands in the way of, of people's spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And that is what confession is all about. Yeah, about softening even the hardest yeah. hearts. And sometimes for a penance, I'll, I'll give the, the penitent the, the chaplet of divine mercy to pray so that, they, that the mercy of God is infectious, that it would be spread to everyone throughout the land, especially those who have the hardest hearts. All right. Let's see if we can get one last caller in. This is uh, Lori from New York. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Hi, Father. Right. My question to you is, can down bus be changed? For example, there's birth control. Okay. Now, over the years, maybe for some reason, I don't know. I'm just making this up now. <laughs> but could there be a change in attitude and direction and because of a reason? I don't know. Sure. So can dogma be okay. changed? No, a dogma cannot be changed. If it is infallible, that means that it's been taught definitively and cannot be changed. Um, yeah. yeah. So. I mean, because that's, when you look historically, Newman made this very important statement. To become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the importance of us knowing history, especially in this area of dogma, because you'll see in history where, because of the culture and the time, there was a pressure to change dogma mm -hmm. at different mm -hmm. times. And there was some times when went up and almost it came down like a handful mm -hmm. of bishops and others that were holding true mm -hmm. like during the Arian controversy of the fourth century mm -hmm. so 
But, no, the church, when you look historically, fought to hold tight to the dogmas. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as the Holy Father even said, he doesn't have the right to change. Exactly. Right. What is true. Right. The, what, what is true is what is true according to the mind of God. And all the Pope and the bishops can do is to reveal what is true. Um, and so that teaching on birth control or on uh, not using contraception is, in a, is, uh, is, comes from the fact that it's simply true. And it was one of, the, actually, Marcus, one of the most beautiful teachings that brought me into the Catholic Church, that here was a church that taught that, artificial con or that contraception was wrong. And uh, for, for very good reasons. And, you know, I mean, just watch Christopher West or the Holy Father who talks about the theology of the body. Yeah. Just learn more about sure. that. And I, I, do, I do believe that someday people will look back at this time under this Holy Father and his teachings uh, and, and trying to take the great teachings of the church and put them through his encyclicals and letters exactly. into uh, the personal philosophy to help us understand our day. He's going to be looked on mm -hmm. as, as the, the Augustine or the... The Thomas Aquinas of our of our age. John Paul the Great, hopefully. Well, <laughs> probably. We'll pray for that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, sir, so much. How about the closing though, and, and reflecting on how your journey into the Catholic Church brought you closer to your Lord Jesus? Well, I'd say first of all that the most intense, the most intimate, the most uh, loving union possible of the soul with Christ is when you receive Holy Communion. And so I would say that I became close to Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior, through Holy Communion. But also through confession, I believe, just to come back to that again, to receive the absolution of the Church. And I would say also through experience of mental prayer. Uh, a better term for that is actually heart prayer. The heart is the place where the mind and the will and the emotions meet, the very center of our being. Uh, meditating in, in terms of that prayer also uh, helps me become even closer to Jesus Christ, my Lord. Father, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Your witness, and uh, may the Lord bless you in your, in your pastoral ministry. And uh, you've been a great witness to all the viewers, I know. And thank you for your Thank you, Marcus. Thanks God for bless joining you. Us. This issue of authority is so important. I mean, we really almost every week we could come down to, with all the issues that we talk about, the issue of authority, regardless of what theme we're talking about. And we live in a day and age when uh, we hear voices from every direction trying to define what is true, whether it's television or movies or the audios and videos, the books. It's a sad state of affairs when you go to one of these large bookstores and, you, and you're, you're overwhelmed by all the books there. You know, I don't know if you know this, but they estimate that 50,000 new titles in English are published every year. So with all these voices in the bookstores and magazine racks and tell, how do you know what's true? You can go to any section of the bookstore and find books that contradict one another everywhere. So you have to end up with the conclusion that there is no truth. It's all relative. What's true for you might not be true for me. Or there is a truth. And how does one determine it? And by Christ's mercy and uh, omniscient understanding of our need, he gave us the church. But throughout the history of the church, a lot of men and women didn't like what the church said. And so we see throughout history, different people rising up and saying, I know what's better than the church. Or they'll point out to those leaders in the church that may not be living their faith as we know they ought to. And say, see, it's corrupt. I know it's better. I'm going to go out and start my own church. And of course, when you know the history, especially of Protestantism, every five days a new denomination starts. So how does one determine again what's true? Well, the most commonly bantered around authority that I hear, especially in academics institution, is this little phrase, most modern scholars. Mm -hmm. That phrase is used to almost defend anything. Mm -hmm. Most modern scholars believe that, then fill in the blank. Well, you see, scholars don't fit into the category of what Jesus defined as his magisterium. It was his apostles that he had chosen. He had given the gift of the Spirit as well as the, the personal nurture and then promised them that that Spirit wouldn't just end when they died, but that we would see, as it says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, that Paul told Timothy to choose and to train. And that's the church that we've been given. And so we need to pray for this church and we need to recognize its authority in our life. Why? Because we love Jesus. And that was the gift he gave us. 
And so together, as a part of this body of Christ, we recognize and appreciate the gift of this authority. Thank you very much for joining us on the journey home. Look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you.